Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Stanley Wu and I am the Omega Coordinator and the Director of the Resilience Project. This webinar is hosted by the Omega Collaborative. Uh, that is a group working on the global poly crisis that includes the Millennium Alliance for Humanity in the Biosphere at Stanford, the Crans Foresight Analysis Nexus or the FAN Initiative, the New School at Commonweal and the Resilience Project. Today, we're delighted to be joined by Dr. Tatsuhiro Suzuki, who will lead this week's urgent follow-up discussion on the Ukraine nuclear reactor and the implications of damage to the largest power plant in Europe. Dr. Suzuki currently serves as both the Vice Director and Professor of Research for Nuclear Weapons Abolition at Nagasaki University, and he is also the former Vice Chairman of the Japan Atomic Energy Commission. This conversation will be hosted by Michael Lerner and Joan, Joan Diamond. And a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat to both panelists and attendees, and we'll get to as many questions as we're able to. Also, please note that this webinar will be recorded and posted on the Omega website. Now, without further ado, Joan Diamond. Yeah, welcome everyone this morning, afternoon, evening, depending upon where you are in the world. When Dr. Suzuki spoke to us last spring, we explored nuclear power plant safety and security in the context of the Russian invasion of the Ukraine. Some thought the Omega Collaborative was being a bit speculative, maybe even alarmist for hosting such a meeting. I had many plausible scenarios of radiation release in my head, but none of them covered the deliberate weaponizing of a nuclear power plant as we are experiencing today. Dr. Suzuki has agreed to return to us today to update us on the situation and risk. He has that rare skill and knowledge to confront nuclear issues from small but powerful technical and analytic detail to the broad existential implications and complexity of those issues. Today, we face not just the vulnerability of nuclear power plants during war, but the active use of nuclear power plants in waging war. Um, it's Dan gave us an introduction to uh, Dr. Suzuki's history, a little bit of it. There's much more that could be covered, and I encourage you to take a look at that. But I'd like to just add one thing, which is that he is a member of the Executive Committee and Council of the Pugwash conferences on science and world affairs. And for those of you who are not familiar with Pugwash, it is the leading international organization aiming to develop and support the use of scientific evidence-based policy making, focusing on areas where nuclear and weapons of mass destruction risks are present. With that, let me turn it over to Michael and um, we can move forward. Thank you, Joan, so much. Uh, Dr. Suzuki, we are so deeply honored to have you return uh, to the Omega webinars for a second time. You know, uh, as, as you know, our focus is the global poly crisis, all of the environmental, social, technological, financial, economic stressors that are interacting with increasing force, creating this uh, global poly crisis, which has many different names. And the sort of leading things that people think about are climate, COVID, and conflicts without end. Uh, and so nuclear tends to be kind of pushed down the list, but it's in the nature of the poly crisis that these different factors will keep surfacing. And little did we anticipate as people spoke about the poly crisis that the nuclear issue would recur in this way. I mean. None of us uh, foresaw, the, or few of us, I should say, foresaw the war in the Ukraine. Some people did. So we're so grateful that, that you, as really a world authority on this, uh, are rejoining us to help us understand how dangerous is the uh, situation at the Zaporizhia plant. And what about the strike by a Russian missile 900 feet from uh, the South Ukraine plant? which I've seen images of it, it was a really big explosion. And uh, so in some way, uh, the Russians seem to be weaponizing uh, threats to nuclear power plants, which to me is astonishing because if one of these plants melted down, 
I don't see how President Putin would survive it politically. You know, I just think that would be a, 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 an event that the blowback into Russia would be extraordinary. So in any case, that's the context. And we welcome your wisdom about uh, the situation, what would be the implications if one of the plants melts down, and how you understand what uh, uh, Putin is doing. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me again uh, to this meeting. I think it's very important to understand the risk of what, what's happening. And uh, I have to tell you that I'm not really uh, following everything. And uh, I, I know many other people who might be willing to share the more deeper insights. But uh, anyway, I have to, I'm happy to talk about my uh, observation, current situation. Uh, with you and give me your feedback. Let me share the screen. Uh, can you see the screen? Yes, okay. we can. All right. So today I won't just want to talk four points. One first one is that uh, uh, finally the IAEA team went to the plant and uh, they observed the situation. And so we understand the current situation much, much better than before, which is very important. And they, they also, uh, their uh, uh, exports uh, remain on the site. That is, that is also very important. However, uh, also, the, all the reactors are shutting down now. So it's, it's also safer uh, than before. But the still, uh, as Michael said, that the military activities around the plant continue. And we have to stop them. That, that's the most important thing. Uh, anything could happen while, if, if the military activities are going on. And a missile attack is probably one of the worst things to happen. But even without attacking directly the plant, many things could happen. And that could lead to a worse nuclear accident. Uh, so we have to stop the military activities. And the IAEA uh, submitted uh, the report, published the report, second, this is the second report, which is very good. Uh, so you may uh, want to read it. But they identify so-called seven pillars of the securing nuclear power plant safety, and that should be maintained. One of even one of them is is not observed. Then it, it could lead to the serious accident. One of the most serious concern is the power loss, and uh, it is already it has already happened that the uh, all power external power was cut off to supply electricity to the plant, which is necessary to cool down the. Uh, the reactor and also spent fuel. So the power loss is, is the one of the most serious concerns we have. And also we have to uh, uh, make sure that the spent fuel pool cooling must be maintained. And the uh, spent fuel pool is much more vulnerable of, than the reactor itself because outside of the containment building. So that's one of the most uh, uh, serious concern we have, and also much more radioactive materials in the uh, spent fuel pool. And finally, there are uh, experts who are computer making computer simulations. What happened if if the serious accident happened at the the Parisia nuclear power plant? So I will show you uh, some of the results, but which showed uh, which this could be worse than the Chernobyl of Fukushima accident. All right. So uh, uh, seven, oh, let's see, seven pillars. Uh, these are the one, two, three, uh, seven pillars that I, I identify, which is a very good summary of what should be maintained. The first one, physical integrity. So if the missile attack or anything, any, any damage to the uh, reactor buildings could lead to serious accident. Uh, particularly the second one, all safety and security systems, that should be maintained. The third one is the staff. That is also a serious uh, situation right now. Uh, um, we don't know actually how much stress, uh, uh, even a physical uh, condition of the staff, and they are maintaining the integrity of the power plant. So their health is very important. And also, as I said, offsite power supply. Uh, it is interesting that if you, because nuclear power plant is to generating electricity power, but in order to generating nuclear power, we need an external power supply. And that, that's very important to know. 
The fourth thing is the supply chains. They need a, a component uh, keep coming in and uh, uh, you know, to maintain the integrity of the plant. That is also very important. Also fuel, uh, external uh, emergency diesel power plant, you need uh, uh, fuel from uh, outside. So they have a stockpile of roughly seven days of the uh, fuel, but that is not probably good enough during the war. So uh, uh, logistical supply chains should be maintained. And uh, uh, radiation monitoring, that is very important to understand what's happening at the plant and also the vicinity of the plant. And finally, the communication. So those are seven pillars. So if you look at the news, whether this one of those seven pillars are missing is a very important point to watch. Uh, this is a picture uh, coming out of uh, the report and the above one, there's a big hole by the, uh, probably the bomb or some, some of the missile maybe. It, it is the Spanfield pool above. So it's very serious. And also some of the radioactive waste uh, being stored in this building. So we are shocked to see this, this uh, big hole. The second one is the reactor building. So the reactor building actually attacked by the breads. So uh, these two pictures show how serious the situation was uh, at the, the Polygia nuclear power plant. And uh, so the recommendation one uh, is to make sure that all these meter activities will be stopped. And they are uh, proposing to create a nuclear safety and security protection zone, no military zone around the vicinity of the nuclear power plant. He, uh, the uh, director general, uh, Dr. Grossi has been negotiating with the United Nations and Russia and Ukraine to make this uh, uh, safety zone, but has not been established yet. And there are other recommendations, but those are basically recommendations to protect the so-called seven pillars. So I don't want to go into detail, but uh, in the report, each recommendation, there are more detailed description of what should be done. So if you're interested in, I think this report is very useful. Okay, this, this picture shows, this is a typical PW. If the missile attack here, this wall could be broken. But you remember, this is a, a reactor. This is a reactor. So even if this is broken, the reactor itself is okay. But if the second missile attack, uh, you never know. And also, uh, this uh, containment uh, building is so-called re reinforced concrete containment, roughly one to 1.5 meters thick, which is, which is very thick and reinforced, it's very strong. So they, they are supposed to uh, resist uh, against the airplane crash, but not missile. And also not just one, if, if the missile one or two, more than one missile, this could be broken. The pr serious problem is if something happened from the reactor because of the, any damage on the safety uh, cooling systems, this is the emergency, water suppresses, this is very important also. And then the gas is coming out of this reactor vessel. And if this containment building is gone, the gas is directly moving, leaving away from, to, the, 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 to the environment. That's what happened to the Fukushima accident. This con concrete containment was broken. So uh, uh, this missile attack does not necessarily lead to the core meltdown itself, but if something happened, all the this containment building is to protect uh, the gas, so not to release to the release, not to release to the environment. Another important thing is Spanfield pool here is outside this containment building. So the, if the missile attack this building, this will be broken. This is a serious problem. And so those are uh, the physical image of the plant. Uh, this is technical detail, but core meltdown and the uh, spent fuel action, uh, technically it's a little bit different, but the most important thing is for us is to remember, uh, even without saying there is no core meltdown, spent fuel pool accident could release the huge amount of radioactive materials to the environment. That's what the, this 
a technical explain, explanation says. So this is a computer simulation done by Jamin Khan, South Korean expert, and uh, uh, Eva Lakovsky, she's a uh, US MIT master student. They have done the uh, computer simulation. This is a different weather. Uh, this is March 2021 uh, weather. They're using that weather. The left one is the third week and the fourth week. The wind, wind is a little bit different. The top one is core meltdown. The second one is Spanfield, Spanfield pool fire. The third one is combined. So you can see Spanfield pool fire is much more serious than the, the uh, core meltdown. This is combined. And you, you can see, depending on the weather, the wide spreading area, you know, area contaminated is quite different. This is um, simulation, similar simulation for Rokasho repressing plant. And again, depending on the other, uh, this is October, this is December, the contamination area is quite different. But the Spanfield pool in Rokasho repressing plant is much bigger. This uh, the amount of radioactivity, 6, 000, more than 6,000 pet petabacterial. It's, it's, you can see the Chernobyl only did this 85 pet petabacterial. Fukushima only 20 petabacterial. So this is huge amount of uh, Spanfield pool in the Rokasho pool plant. Typically the one gigawatt nuclear power plant contains 370 petabacterial. So, uh, how much could be released is very important to, to, to damage, to assess the damage. And this is also their calculation of how many people have to be evacuated if the serious accident happened at the Zaporizhia. And uh, this is the uh, compulsory evacuation. You have to leave by, by the law, but it's voluntary. They are expecting some people will leave because of the accident. The, the area, not only Ukraine, the huge amount of area could be affected by this accident. I think this is, oh, this is the Japanese Rokasho replacement plant. This again, it, it, uh, this 391, 800 square kilometers is bigger than Japan itself. So the impact of the uh, hypothetical replacement plant accident is, is very, very se severe. I think this is the end of my talk. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Yeah. Suzuki. Um, where to start? It, calling, just listening to you, if we were just informally to summarize some of the key things you said, uh, the, the situation at the plant has been stabilized, it's better. Yeah. But the concern about uh, the external power supply, which has been cut before, but is now restored, uh, is one critical issue. Secondly, the psychological and physical health of the staff. And thirdly, in addition to the possibility of the meltdown of uh, different numbers of reactors, there is the question of release of radioactive material into the air. And there's the question of the um, reprocessing plant and what happens if that is also compromised. So I wonder if I got that accurate. Yes, the final point, uh, there is no reprocessing plant in Ukraine, so oh, that okay. is only for Japan's concern, mm -hmm. but, but it's a spent fuel pool uh, do exist in, in each nuclear power plant. Right. So spent fuel pool accident could happen in Ukraine. Right. So before we went on, uh, I was asking you, I don't think there is an answer, but we were simply speculating why is it that President Putin would uh, threaten nuclear power plants when if there is an accident, uh, it might well end his reign in Russia? I mean, that's what happened with Chernobyl. And so uh, one would think just from a pure self-preservation point of view that he would want a... Uh, <laughs> a safe zone around nuclear power plants. And uh, so we were speculating about it. It was very, I mean, is it that he is wanting to show that he's, he's willing to threaten 
doing anything? Is that the way, it, are there people who are thinking about this? I mean, how, how are the people who are expert on gaming these things out do we know what they believe is going on there? I don't know, but, but the speculation is there are a couple of things. One is, as you said, that uh, he's just threatening. He's not intending to actually destroy the reactor itself. And uh, uh, so far, he hasn't done that, but mm -hmm. he's making a serious threat to the West. Uh, he could destroy the reactor. Uh, this is a similar threat he is making uh, of nuclear weapons. And I don't think he will use nuclear weapon. I don't think he's going to destroy the reactor. However, he could do that anytime. That is a serious threat to the rest of the world. Second point is attacking power lines, attacking power plants is probably one of the military strategies to cut off electricity supply to Ukraine. And which is serious also uh, because new, the Polish nuclear power plant was one of the key uh, largest nuclear power plant site and is supplying large amount of electricity, roughly 25% or so uh, of the electricity to Ukraine. So now it's that part of the electricity is cut off. That is a big damage to the uh, Ukraine also. So uh, those are the two. Uh, the speculations that I, I can think of what he's trying to do. And do we have any evidence at all of how much psychological, physical stress the operators are under? Is anybody able to note that or report on that? There's a couple of uh, description in the report, but no direct uh, description of the, how many people were damaged or injured or uh, or kill, even killed. I don't think there's any evidence we can talk about the, the, the damage done to the, to the uh, operators. But I, I can see uh, that the Russian soldiers have done to the general public. Uh, I'm sure their physical uh, damage could be done to the, to the operator too. So that's a huge, serious, you know, psychological stress hmm. uh, of the operators. And in terms of human health uh, outcomes, you showed us a, an extraordinary uh, chart. I wonder if you could put that back up. Is that hard for you to do the slide where you showed us uh, how many people might need to be relocated that slide? Is that hard to do? No, uh, let me share. Can you see it? Yeah. Um, can you center it for us so that we can see the whole thing? We Oh, there we go. Okay, so relocated populations, week four, uh, compulsory. Was this for, uh, is this for the Ukraine? This is for Ukraine, Russia, Romania, Moldova. This is around the area also. Now let's keep that right there. Okay. So, um, this is uh, hypothetical nuclear accidents at the Zaporizhia plant, um, relocated populations for a hypothetical nuclear accident. And if we look at week four, Ukraine, it's 360,000 to 1.6 million plus 280,000 to 2.4 million. Uh, Turkey, uh, two point, we can all see these numbers. Uh, Russia seems very low compared to the others. Why is Russia so low? Russia is north, uh, depending on the wind direction. And oh. also, uh, uh, Russia is a little bit farther than, I don't know how much Turkey is <laughs> from the Ukraine, I'm not sure. Right. But I think this is particularly depending on uh, uh, the weather situation. So, yeah, uh, and I don't know. And <coughs> sorry, review for us uh, the just the the range of health consequences for people uh, in say a median exposure calculation. Uh, we're talking about um, 
you know, we're talking about millions of people being relocated, but of course the exposures would go far, far beyond that. What do we know about the human health consequences of this kind of accident? Well, for the Chernobyl accident, people were not told of what was happening at that time, the first week of so. So they received the large uh, radiation. Uh, also, uh, they drank the milk, contaminated milk, particularly the children. That caused serious health impacts on the Chernobyl case. The Japanese case, uh, the evacuation was much faster than the Chernobyl. And uh, the estimated radiation dose was much lower than the Chernobyl. Although the area, I mean, uh, uh, I cannot say. And also, that they did not drink uh, contaminated water or, or milk. So, uh, so far, after 10 years, 11 years, no direct uh, death caused by the radiation damage by the Fukushima accident. That was the, the report. Uh, by the government. Some speculated some of the deaths uh, may be caused by the radiation of the Fukushima accident. We, we just don't know. And, but the, uh, uh, in the Chernobyl case, uh, I think roughly 5,000 people already are, uh, affected by the cancer. Uh, and uh, uh, the Fukushima case, the title of the cancer for children, uh, roughly 200, 300 people, uh, children, uh, uh, title of cancer, but it's not clear whether that is caused by the Fukushima accident. And also uh, Fukushima case, so-called accident related death, which is means that uh, uh, because of the stress or uh, uh, the uh, patients from the hospital died during the, uh, evacuation or after the evacuation, uh, without the Fukushima accident, they could have survived. So-called accident rate of death is more than 3,000 people. So uh, uh, that's, the, that's the scale of the uh, uh, impact of the accident so far. And so depending on the evacuation uh, and the accident management scenarios, the people who you know, the direct impact, health impact of the accident could uh, could vary significantly. But the more important thing is both Chernobyl and Fukushima, uh, the social, legal, social, ethical uh, impact on, on the people's lives, uh, cultural uh, impact on the people's lives, are, uh, irreversible, that's a problem. And people cannot go back to the home country for a long, long time. And so I wouldn't just call that the health impacts is the only problem we have because of a nuclear accident. You know, also the contaminated land, the Japanese case that uh, decontamination efforts still continue. And it's not, it's not possible to, to decontaminate everything, area or areas. And Ch Russia did not uh, decontaminate much compared with Japan. So. So I, I think in the particularly the, also uh, the reactor accident, which I showed last time, the longer lives radioactive nuclear is much larger, like cesium. And so the in, in, environmental impact could, could long last than the nuclear bomb. And that is also another impact that we have to consider. So imagining again, using these uh, uh, week four figures, uh, it, 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 between voluntary and uh, compulsory, uh, we have about 4 million people uh, maximum uh, there uh, that are relocated. Uh, how wide a, a, again, I know it's how difficult to respond to this, but how large a geographical area uh, would uh, likely be contaminated for a long period of time where it was a great risk to live in it. Well, this, this show, this is uh, 
Right there, it is for for Japan. Right. No, this is the this is Ukraine. This is uh, I don't know. This is this is I think this is this is the plant. Right. And so it's much wider than the Ukraine. This is this goes to I think Russia. I'm not sure. I cannot see the map very well. But anyway, uh, if you combine the reactor accident and the spent fuel accident. Yeah. Uh, depending on the weather, it's quite different. But this this one is much worse than this one. This is March. This is March. This is fourth week of March. This is the third week of March. So depending on the weather, this is also uh uh I think I can I have to show this one is very serious area for the accident. And I can have to say, if you compare with the Chernobyl, this is much worse. Mm. Compared to uh, much worse. I right. think so. I think so. I think there are some numbers here. I think it was uh, numbers. No, uh, Chernobyl was the eight, 85 petabacro. I'm not sure how much petabacro, but it's depending on, you know, I, I think, again, there are many, many assumptions you have to make. Yes. So, uh, uh, but remember, you have also six nuclear power plants in the Zaporizhia. This is only one reactor accident. Okay. So, if, as I said last time, if one reactor happened at the core meltdown, the operator cannot go close to the power plant. So, it is possible the second one, third one will go also core meltdown. That's what happened in, in Japan case. So, so if, yes, in that case, if one melted down, uh, can there be an effect, a chain reaction of the others melting down with it? Yeah, not I wouldn't call it chain reaction, but, yeah. but yes, yes, right. you cannot, you cannot stop, you cannot stop, okay. you cannot control uh, other reactors. So you, have, you cannot prevent. Yeah, you cannot prevent. You cannot, you know. You don't know what's going to happen to the next reactor, but basically, it's very difficult to contain the accident if one one reactor was. Uh, that's what I'm concerned. So, if you have a six nuclear power plants, all core meltdown, uh, Chernobyl is just one. So, and it, the size is much bigger, roughly one point five times bigger than the Chernobyl. So, so if you one point times times six means or close to 10 times bigger than the Chernobyl. That's what the people were scaring, you know. But, uh, you know, that's that's probably the worst case, but we have to be prepared. You know, if, if one serious accident happened, I don't know how to contain the nuclear accident. Um, anyway, so <laughs> that's what I was worrying about, so. John, were you going to? Uh, well, I, yeah, along those lines, I was going to ask the question. You spoke about the seven pillars, and a couple of times you said we have to make sure this doesn't happen, or in the affirmative, something does happen. But who makes sure, and how do we do that? Um, <laughs> well, typically, uh, I mean, Typically, the operators are responsible. So are there backup staff coming in from other nuclear power plants or countries, or it's all on the shoulders? That wasn't clear from the report. I think, um, because currently, my suspicion is all the staff are still same same staff, but I'm not sure. Uh, they may allow now the repressing of the uh, staff. And, that's another serious concern also. Um, so I think the it, it is very important that the, the reactor management should be returned to the Ukraine. And otherwise we don't know what's gonna happen. Since now IAEA staff is on the site, it's probably the situation is probably better. And they are probably demanding that uh, the operator should, you know, rotate. Yeah. yeah. And, and I heard that, that also the Russian uh, nuclear operators are on the site, uh, but they have not 
uh, directly operating the plant. They are also still demanding that the Ukrainian staff will operate the plant. So just in case, I think the Russians maybe may could help to contain the accident, the, uh, the operating the plant. But I think typically speak, typically the, the operators know the plant the best. So it's better that the operator of the Ukrainian operators mm -hmm. should, should come back to, to the plant. We have a comment from uh, Robert Gold, Dr. Robert Gold. Um, uh, uh, Robert, maybe you can repost that to uh, everyone, but I'll read it. Um, it's Right now, it's just a host and panelist. Uh, he has a long history with Physicians for Social Responsibility. One would have also expected that Putin would be restrained from attacking Ukraine so as not to risk becoming a salesman for NATO expansion. Major problem is the extraordinary unquestioned reliance on such dangerous systems, nuclear weapons and nuclear plants for quote security, whereby we are on the brink of utter catastrophe. Something to think about in the current context of extending life of Diablo power plant in the US or continuing nukes at the heart of US policy as evinced by remarks of Anthony Blinken, Secretary of State at the UN and the recent failed nuclear non-proliferation treaty talks. We really need first to stop fighting around these facilities and end this war as soon as possible by expedited negotiation. No question about that. And also from Charles Patton at Commonwealth, Dr. Suzuki, I have attended a Pugwash conference where we were doing a documentary on Leo Zillard it's so good to know that Pugwash Science as science groups continues to address the possibility of nuclear energy accidents. Uh, also from Gwyneth Alexander, depending on wind direction, how far would the potential fallout ultimately reach? Would it become a continent-wide problem? And if so, how long would that take? So those are a few of the comments. Anything you want to pick up on there, Dr. Suzuki? Um, I have been uh, uh, discussing with the nuclear security experts in Japan how to respond to this Ukrainian crisis. Uh, as you already know, that the protection of, of the nuclear power plants is not designed to against the military activities, and uh, legally speaking. Uh, probably for all countries, that the operators are not responsible for protecting the plant against military activities. The defense the military people will come in. The question is, we, we, are, we don't know now that the, the distinction between so-called heavy terrorism attacks and the so-called military activities in terms of action could be very similar. The how you define this attack is caused by the terrorists or caused by the military. And so there's a you know, overlapping area that the particular action could be caused by the terrorists or caused by the military action. So then what should we do? Uh, legally speaking, it's very clear, but in the reality, it's not clear. So protection of the nuclear power plant is much, much more difficult. And because of this uh, Ukrainian crisis. And I think it's a good idea to, to, uh, to discuss, uh, to, to de-investigate de the so-called uh, terrorist threats. What kind of terrorist threats we have to consider, for instance, capturing the nuclear power plants is, is already happened in the Ukraine case. That, that could be done by terrorists. How are you going to respond? So that's the serious question that we have to face if you have a nuclear power plant. So if you have a nuclear power plant, I would suggest there shouldn't be a war. <laughs> you should not be involved in the war. But if you want, if you if you're prepared to, have, to if you're ready to, to uh, be in the military action, I think you have to shut down all reactors and uh, uh, you should be ready to protect the nuclear power plants against military action. So those are 
very, very difficult things to do. Uh, so th th that's uh, my current thinking. And mm. also, uh, far, depending on the wind direction, yes, it, it could go reach to, you know, even under the Chernobyl accident, uh, the radioactive cloud go all over the world, which is, which is significant, but it's, uh, the radioactivity amount is very small. So it, the impact was much, uh, much less. And even Fukushima accident, uh, the water, seawater carried radioactive materials around the globe. Uh, but it's, again, the, the amount is not, not much, so uh, the impact will be uh, not much. But uh, uh, so radioactive cloud could go anywhere if the, once it is released to the environment. But I think important is, is, is the wind and also it, whether it rains or snows. If it rains, it's called the reactive materials go down to the ground. And that's, that's a serious part. So if the weather is okay, the radioactive materials will be go outside. Uh, so the uh, wind and the weather is a critical factor to assess the environment impact. Hmm. Um, I know that when Fukushima took place, that you, in our last webinar, you talked about having how it impacted your own thinking on nuclear safety. Yes. Um, with this continuing uh, unfolding of nuclear accidents and, new, and threats to nuclear plants, are you continuing to reassess your own sense of whether nuclear power is a viable long-term option? Well, as I said, I think nuclear power is like a strong medicine uh, with a strong by side effect. So if you need to take a medicine, you have to be careful about the, what the side effects are. My thinking is side effects is much, much more serious than I thought. So I wouldn't take the medicine until I feel I'm dying. <laughs> uh, but so it, it's better to keep you a healthy, healthy body, uh, healthy conditions. That's most important. So, so that you don't have to depend on nuclear power. And uh, but you know the the globe right now, the Earth is facing climate change. This is a serious threat also. So if you need to take medicine like a nuclear power, it may you know you may need nuclear power in some countries, but that's have to very very should be carefully done. Uh, and you have to know not only the benefits of nuclear power, you have to know the risk of nuclear power. That's my kind of thinking. In Japan, I, I, I already been suggesting that we should, we should reduce the dependence on nuclear power as, as soon as possible. Mm. Um, are you following, I imagine you are, um, some of the advances in thinking about nuclear energy, the fusion uh, conversations, but above all, I read, um, somewhere about uh, experiments in Sweden with small, very small floating uh, mm -hmm. nuclear plants that if they go uh, critical, they, they sink. And so they remain radioactive, but the point is that uh, there's not the threat of a, a bigger meltdown. Have you followed what's going on with those experiments? I have no. I don't know. I don't know that, that experiment. But uh, there are proposals, actually, uh, so-called innovative design, which mm -hmm. has a future so-called inherent safety, which means that without any human in intervention, that the reactor could be shut down very safely. Mm -hmm. And that has been proposed for more than probably thirty years. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it's too innovative for the reactor operators to operate. <laughs> That's a problem. Also, it's too innovative for the licensing, nuclear regulatory licensing. People have to figure it out how to regulate that such kind of reactor. Um, so practically speaking, um, even if the so-called innovative reactors are demonstrated right now, I don't know how many reactors will be actually ordered by the uh, operators. And the economics also are not certain. And uh, and also uh, like this, you know, even if this reactor, current deposition nuclear power plants are so-called inherent safety reactors, 
the still risk still remain. So uh, risk cannot be eliminated. But uh, it, if you build a nuclear power plant, of course, the sa better safety future is better. Uh, mm -hmm. But again, the risk remains. So you have to be very careful. Uh, so I, there's no risk-free nuclear power plant. Mm -hmm. Joan, any further reflection? Oh, well, a couple of um, questions. One of them deals with this issue of spent fuel. And as you mentioned, that's clearly a vulnerability at the power plants and has been in other accidents and will be around for a long time, even if we're able to move away from nuclear. Are there you know, major efforts to deal with the spent fuel in less vulnerable ways? Yes. The best... Uh short-term answer is to move the spent fuel from pool to so-called the dry cask, uh, which is much more resilient and uh, you don't need the power to cool. It's air-cooled. And uh, Fukushima accident, at the Fukushima accident site, there are a couple of so-called dry cask fuel, spent fuel storage. And the building was damaged by the tsunami, but the cask was safe. So I think the, the world is moving uh, safely right now. If you can shift the spent fuel pool to dry gas storage, the risk will be much smaller. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one possibility. And mm -hmm. of, of course, if you uh, dispose the waste uh, in, under the ground, uh, geological disposal, in terms of against military activities, but not much safer. Right. So I ha and I have a question, very different sort of question, but I have found that colleagues and friends in Europe are very, very worried about uh, this issue. And they feel impatient with those of us in the US feel like what I've been told that we're not taking it seriously. We don't realize what it means to you know, their lives. I mean, uh, and is, I don't know, is there anything that we can do just to bring maybe front and center, and I'm talking a little bit US centric and um, here front and center, what this is actually meaning to the rest of Europe. That's not just Ukraine, it's not sure. just um, Russia, but but all of Europe. Well, you know, think about, remember 9-11, the hijackers were trying to attack with an airplane on the nuclear power plant. And it was obvious that they are trying to make a serious uh, accident by the, by the airplane crash. That's why we are now, the building is, containment building is against the airplane crash. But uh, terrorists could, cause similar um, risk like this. That's what I'm worrying about. Mm -hmm. If the terrorists are watching this event, aha, uh -huh, I can see how we can threat the people. Uh, you know, this, has, this can be done not by the military activities, but could be done by, you know, power cut off, spent fuel pool, uh, capturing the plant, that can be done uh, by terrorist groups. So we have to be, you know, if you have a nuclear power plant or if you have a new radioactive materials, uh, risk is there all over the world. So uh, I, I'm concerned about, you know, I mean, the military activities that such kind of meta activity is probably unconceivable just you know one year ago when that happened then i think terrorist activities could be more more uh, likely that's my concern oh, i see okay uh just to harvest a few more comments again from bob gould of psr primary prevention of the nuclear weapons threats we're facing can be explored within work of the Back from the Brink campaign. 
And Chet Chizuski, a, a valued colleague, uh, has provided some wonderful links. Uh, you can all see the other comments. Uh, Cheryl Patton uh, from Commonweal uh, has been working with Ukrainian firefighters and wonders, uh, is, uh, is any training occurring in the Ukraine for firefighters in case the site is seriously compromised? I think Cheryl would probably know that better than anyone since she's been getting assistance to Ukrainian firefighters. Uh, I have uh, uh, two questions. The first is, um, I read somewhere uh, some time ago when I was thinking about nuclear accidents, what the recommendations were for people in exposed zones, uh, just about what to do if there's a major exposure and let's imagine for a second that they are not in the zone that requires evacuation, but they're concerned about exposures that they think are uh, a worry for their health. And what I remember is being told to stay indoors and keep the windows and everything shut. But then I remember that there was some indication that the uh, the fallout wouldn't be over very quickly, and it was really useful to have a radiation meter uh, before you went outside to determine uh, when when it's safe to go back outside. Um, what would you say to people who want to be prepared for this possibility, whether in Europe or in the United States or anywhere else? How long? Uh, would one want to shelter indoors? Uh, is it easy to get meters that uh, will tell you when it's safe? And just what are the practical dimensions of that? Well, I think the radiation monitoring is very, very important. And uh, uh, if you have a nuclear power plant, already the radiation monitoring is there. So in the Fukushima case, uh, unfortunately, the, if the power was cut off, at that time, the power was cut off. So the radiation monitoring was also cut off. That was a problem. So people have to go there to monitor the, uh, the radioactivity. But that's one very important. So you need a battery for monitoring, radiation monitoring uh, also. Uh, that's for sure. And also the, your, uh, the film batch for yourself. And radiation monitoring is just the monitoring sampling, not a, not a particular spot. Uh, you have to go, uh, there's a hot spot, so-called, you know, radioactive materials can concentrate in a particular area. You have, you have to go and monitor those things, not by monitoring area, but monitoring post is only the one particular spot, so you cannot monitor everywhere. Uh, so you need to monitor uh, other areas also with, with your own activities. If you, if you want to go outside the contaminated area, you need a Film batch to wear the film batch all the time. Um, right after the accident, if the radioactive clouds coming in, the iodine should you have to take iodine, particularly the children. Don't don't dry, don't drink the contaminated water or, or milk or whatever. Or eat or food, and so monitoring of food also very important. And I think those are the, and then probably in the in radiation monitoring right now in, in Fukushima case, after 10 years, you know, the uh, roughly uh, cesium is 32 years, uh, half a time, I think. So 10 years is roughly half. And mm -hmm. no, no, not half, sorry, one fourth. And I, I think, so it, it's from now on, it's a gradient. Yeah, it, it's it's uh, it, the radiation level is is going down very very slowly. The first half year, first 10, 15, 16 years is probably rapidly going down and then very slowly. So, so uh, uh, from now on, it's very difficult to 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 expect to the radiation level is going down very quickly. Mm -hmm. So the first 10 years is very important. Robert. Uh, this Robert Isaacson just put a really nice link. Yeah. Uh, ready.gov uh, nuclear explosion. So anyway, that's a, 
a simple along the lines that we've been talking about. Um, my second question is, uh, Ted Koppel uh, wrote a book, the, the famous uh, US journalist called Lights Out, where he took a serious look at the uh, threat from either terrorists or hostile uh, powers to the US power grid as a whole. And he pointed out that various hostile powers have completely uh, mined the US grid and we've mined the grids of other people, other states. So there is, there's kind of a nuclear like standoff where we could take down uh, the Russian grid or whatever and the Russians could take down ours. If somebody takes down the power grid, um, it can be many months before power can be restored. That suggests that a, a non-trivial possibility is that somebody takes down the grid and with uh, diesel generators providing relatively short periods of time of power, uh, 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 we should be concerned. Actually, Joan Diamond and I and others in Omega uh, had some real conversations on this. But again, the interactivity of these different possibilities is extraordinary. You don't have to be attacking the plant itself. If you take right. down the grid, there's a serious issue. Yes. Basically, the life, lifetime, life uh, sustaining infrastructure is very important to, to protect those life, life supporting infrastructure, power, water, food. So, uh, you know, not just nuclear power plants, you're right, that those are the key infrastructure you have to protect. I think that's what the military activities are trying to do uh, to protect the uh, lifeline uh, infrastructure. Uh, there are uh, plans to, you know, of course, how to call uh, backup supply mm -hmm. electricity, but I think, you know, uh, you remember Hurricane uh, Katrina? Uh, if you if you cut off all life life lifeline, it would take a long time to recover. That's for sure. Okay. Uh, but it I is difficult to to destroy everything at one time. You know, uh, so there is always possibility of cover up. If for, if for instance electricity, you may you may get electricity from other part of the country or other part of the uh, Europe. Uh, so it, it, you have to arrange, you have to be cooperative if someone is short of electricity. And that kind of arrangement, regional grid is very important. We don't John, have it, Japan. Yes. Thank you. Joan, you, you remember our conversations on this. Would you like to add anything about the, uh, the threats to the grid and nuclear power? No, it's just that we worked with Bob Budnitz, who did a nice little paper for us on some, some of the redundancies in the system. Yes. But I read it, an article yesterday that said, sort of said this, it's a little bit over a statement. Don't worry so much about nuclear. The real threat is cyber war. Yeah. The, the, the cyber war can take us out in terms of the energy, food, water, the infrastructure. Um, you know, more effectively and quicker, and that we are not paying enough attention to that threat, either state-sponsored cyber war or the sort of terrorist cyber. I agree. I, I just want to note there may be some people who need to leave us at the top of the hour. We thank you. We're going to stay on with Dr. Suzuki for a little more time, uh, and we welcome you all staying on. I want to harvest some of the wonderful comments. We can't respond to them all. Uh, but Robert Gould writes, uh, an appropriately skewered uh, and appropriately skewered in follow-up response by the New York City campaign to abolish nuclear weapons a week later and what reached millions. So, um, uh, so there are all kinds of uh, beautiful comments here. Uh, Robert Isaacson notes, uh, we've been talking about it, Ukraine says, second largest nuclear plant hit by Russian attacks. And we, uh, we noted that. Um, so um, 
uh, I'm just trying to think what the most valuable direction. Dr. Suzuki, what have we not talked about yet that from your point of view, as you just look at the overview, um, uh, would be most useful for us to keep in mind? What are what are uh, we? We've been asking you about threats that we can see. Uh, you have all this immense experience, and you are deeply connected with the most uh, serious scientific and policy thought. What have we not asked you about? What is um, what? What seems really critical that we haven't considered? Well, one of the biggest lessons we learn from Fukushima is think think unthinkable that that is difficult uh, so if you are too close to the current situation think think unthinkable is very difficult because you 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 tend to be more optimistic so you need a, a some kind of expert group to questioning always okay just think unthinkable like i think your group <laughs> like you like your group I think it's very important for your group to to raise the issue that okay the, the common sense may think this is the way to go but the world is full of unexpected surprises so you have to be ready you have to be prepared for unthinkable situation unfortunately and that is a good exercise you, you need to do it daily as a daily exercise Otherwise, in my own experience, that uh, people tend, even under the crisis situation, people tend to think to be optimistic. Mm -hmm. Okay, this will not happen. Uh, I think this will work, and so, so everything should be okay. That's you know that's the people's set of mind, and uh, I think uh, so. If you are in the situation like this, think unthinkable is is probably uh, the most important exercise you have to remember. Mm -hmm. I have one quick answer to the question that is there any way to decontaminate the water? Yes, we, ha we have a way to decontaminate water, like a filter to absorb the radioactive materials or separating chemically, which is very difficult, but that could be done also. So we are decontaminating the uh, uh, water from the Fukushima uh, reactor itself right now. Is that something that can be done with an affordable filter at home or is it a yes, high... Yes. A, I, I, I don't think it's cheap. <laughs> I think it's better to to be a more centralized system. But uh, uh, mm -hmm. there is a yes filter. If, you know, it, it, just a regular filter is also helpful. Okay. Uh, even just a regular filter at home is helpful. So don't drink the water without any filtering. Mm -hmm. For not only for radioactive materials, but also <laughs> contaminated water. So it is, it is possible, yes. So from a point of view of a family somewhere in the world, somewhere in Europe, um, concerned about the very real possibility that it could go wrong in the Ukraine with one of these plants. Um, iodine tablets, are they good for the adults as well as the kids or? I think the, the kids is more important. If you have a, a limited number of iodine breads, Right. you should give it to the children and uh, young women also and then you would need if you're going to shelter indoors you're going to need water and food and other necessities for what at least a week maybe several yeah, weeks? at least a week i think at least a week All right. and that that should be a good uh yeah and is there um it, what kind are the meters to measure radiation outdoors inexpensive and readily available Yes, we have a carrier, I know, uh, carry, carry a portable. Right. You, you can carrying. see them on the web for around yeah. $100. Not too expensive, not too expensive. Wonderful. Um, uh, uh, Joan, what, any other questions? Um, no, but I feel that I personally have shifted in the last few months um, regarding thinking about, you know, what could happen with nuclear power plants. I mean, I don't think I was particularly unrealistic or uninformed in February, but <clears throat> things that, you know, I didn't imagine weaponizing 
a power plant, though, you know, I can be pretty grim on, on other topics. But if one follows your logic, Tatsu, and we really need to move away from any sort of nuclear power, and um, that it just can't, you know, that given terrorism, given state actors, given threats, given the world we're living in, then that has, you know, incredible implications for, you know, for, for how we live, what we need in terms of energy and our country and lifestyles. And, um, and that's just another level of the sobering uh, thinking that's necessary. Yeah, but, but I, I agree. Uh, uh, but climate change is also very serious. Yeah. And also, I, I would think that uh, it's not the nuclear power plant, which is the best thing itself, but the war. Mm -hmm. I think the war, I, I can, I cannot think of uh, such a, you know, lively broadcasting the war to the rest of the world. This is incredible uh, mm -hmm. under the current, you know, 21st century. And, but this war is, is visible, but cyber war cannot be visible. That's okay. another serious concern. So I think my lesson is not just nuclear power plant. I think we have to prevent the war. We have to finish the war. We have, and that's the most important. I think the power wash also is dedicated to not just abolishing the nuclear weapons, but abolishing the war itself. Otherwise, the risk of catastrophic event remains all over so, the world. So cyber is, is we oh, also serious. have to remember yes, yes. a weapon of mass destruction. Yes. yes. And also. as you pointed out, Dr. Suzuki, the um, the possibility of terrorist attacks, whether by cyber or you know direct attacks, uh, is there in addition to war as a yes. as a primary? Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. I agree. Yeah. Well, Dr. Suzuki, this has been extraordinarily helpful to us, oh, and. Thank you. We're so grateful to you for coming back. Um, I think one of the takeaways for me is that the health impact uh, may actually be less prominent than simply the massive relocation yeah. of, of people in, you know, mm -hmm. 4 million people perhaps. Yeah. Uh, and the immense impact of that culturally, economically, financially, psychologically right. on Europe. Uh, right. And uh, just so one can see that an accident here might really rearrange geopolitical relationships, uh, cultural, re it, it would be an immense event. Uh, and not only for Europe, but around the world. And so we can't foresee it, but what we can do is if we imagine it and chart out not only the things that we've talked about now, but talk to people who really think clearly about the chain of events that might follow from it, then the question is, what would be the opportunity that came with this immense disaster for shifts in national, regional, and global institutions so that we could drive them through in that moment which a, a global crisis creates. And I wonder who the people are who are doing the best thinking on what, not only with the catastrophe and preparing for it, but what the opportunity would be, uh, which might be a once in a lifetime opportunity. Yeah, I think in this case, for instance, you have to thank the existence of IAEA. Yes. Uh, without IAEA, it's very difficult for outsiders to go into that plan objectively to assess the situation. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank God that the uh, United Nations has an international <laughs> IAEA. Uh, so we, we need some kind of, you know, uh, international scheme 
to respond to this crisis, WHO against pandemic and climate change. We don't have any international organizations against climate change. Um, so I think international cooperation in a way that so more system systematically respond to the uh, catastrophic event, we need uh, uh, some this kind of scheme to respond and cooperatively and also professionally. Uh, that, that's my lesson from this current crisis. But you know, I think the most important is stop the war. Yeah. Uh, even if the nuclear power plants, now even if the safe so-called safety zone is created as IAEA is proposing, that's only for nuclear power plant. And as long as war continues, uh, it's, it's very sad to see the, uh, the film of the, the, the video of, of the, uh, the villages and the towns are destroyed by, the, by this war. So, mm. Well, we cannot thank you enough. I want to tell all those who stayed with us that we're going to capture the chat and send it out to you all so that you have a record of all the wonderful comments that people made that we haven't been able to get to all of them. Uh, Dr. Suzuki, uh, Joan Diamond, I'm going to give you the last words here before we close and turn it over to Stanley. I just want to say thank you. I mean, you've it's been a very rich conversation with a lot of notes and things to think about. So thank you very much. And thank you, Michael. Uh, it's a great joy. Stanley, thank you very we, much. we turn it back over to you, Stanley. Dr. Suzuki, Suzuki, thank you so much. Michael, Joan, thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate your time and we appreciate you being here. A recording of this webinar will be made available on omega.ngo and the Resilience Project websites. If you're interested in receiving more uh, invitations to events like this, you can register on our website. And thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you again on our next webinar. Good thank day. you, Dr. Suzuki. Thank you. Bye. Take Bye -bye. care.